Uh, my charge in being here is to discuss what's been happening in Missouri over the last year and a half as far as what we call Proposition B, which was the Puppy Mill uh, Cruelty Prevention Act. And that's kind of a whole different ball game uh, in fighting an issue uh, over livestock uh, agriculture. But I'd like to try to tie the two in uh, for you as we move forward here over the next few minutes. So what is our story in Missouri? Missouri is a livestock state. Agriculture is the number one industry in our state and over 55% of farm income comes from animal agriculture. We're in the top 10 in basically almost all of the livestock production categories that are there. Uh, agriculture is spread all over our state from the north to south and east uh, and west. You know, over the last few years, we have been watching what's been going on around the United States and other states that animal activists and HSUS and other folks have been invading, basically, and trying to take away the rights of farmers to raise the food, uh, you know, for America. So how did our issue get started in Missouri? Missouri is a ballot initiative state, and that's both a blessing and a curse. You can represent the people of Missouri, if our state legislature does not act. But then also, in, in many cases, such as with the Proposition B, and I, we talk about it being puppy mill, or that's what HSUS would like us to say, but we try not to use the words puppy mill in Missouri because that's basically a derogatory uh, term to a dog breeder. And so we try not to use uh, you know, those terms uh, there. But as the issue was going on in Ohio, uh, and what they dealt with there, uh, Missouri was basically recognizing that we were on a short list of states that the animal activists might be ready to move into uh, after they finished uh, trying to work in Ohio. We fully expected them to come into Missouri, since we are a livestock state, with a livestock ballot initiative. And so in November they did come in with a ballot, of 2009 came in with a ballot initiative um, but it was not targeted at animal agriculture. It was targeted at the dog breeders uh, in our state. So you might ask why did they pick on dog breeders in the state of Missouri when we are uh, a livestock state there? Well, Missouri's kennel industry is the big dog of dog breeders across our nation, no pun intended there. We had over 2,400 licensed breeders, and we have unlicensed breeders as well, and that's basically part of the problem that we face there. But the good guys with the white hat, the licensed breeders, number one in the nation as far as number of, of breeders um, that we have there. And basically, besides being number one in breeders, we have two to three of the largest um, puppy brokers to the pet stores across the nation. Uh, there too. Besides having the most breeders, Missouri probably supplies approximately 30 percent of all of the puppies that are in a puppy store across the nation come from Missouri. So that's why the animal activists picked on Missouri uh, is because if they could take down the kennel industry in Missouri, they could take down the kennel industry in any other state because they got the big one. And again, in their usual fashion, they tried to slice off a little corner of the piece of cake there with a group that they thought nobody else would support, especially in a livestock uh, state there. The kennel industry is huge. It's a $2.4 billion industry in Missouri, provides a lot of jobs and a lot of tax revenue uh, you know, to our state. It is also one of the most highly regulated industries uh, as far as animal agriculture is concerned, and we consider dog breeders animal agriculture uh, in Missouri with that. Missouri Farm Bureau is a general farm organization. We're probably one of maybe two, possibly three state farm bureaus that actually had a section in our policy booklet on kennels. A lot of our members are kennels, and they also farm uh, you know, as well. But this is a very highly uh, regulated industry and had been with our Animal Care Facilities Act that had been put in place back in 1992. The problem is uh, the other side uses smoke, mirrors, and deception with all of their pictures to basically tell a story that's not true about the kennel industry 
uh, in Missouri. So we had to basically put a, a new face on, on the kennel owners as we do when they attack livestock uh, organizations as well. And another thing that I learned, you know, as we moved on into this particular issue with dog breeders, they come from all walks of life. I mean, we have a lot of farmers that raise dogs, especially when we across our dairy belt, which is the south central area and southwestern part of our state, that as they have gone out of business over the last 15 to 20 years, uh, the wife and, and even the husband basically have taken on a kennel operation to supplement their income so that they can stay uh, on the land. Teachers, professionals, veterinarians, uh, lawyers, I mean, they come from all walks of life uh, there. The Puppy Mill Pre Cruelty Prevention Act was the title of the ballot initiative. Now just look at the title of that. Is that not biased? Puppy Mill, I've already said, is a derogatory term to a dog breeder. The animal activists have put, uh, anytime we hear the word puppy mill now or factory farm, it's been said enough that the consumer out here automatically thinks negatively when they hear those terms. And that's the sole intent uh, of the animal activists is word recognition and basically getting us to think one way in the way that they, they want uh, you know, us to think. But the Puppy Mill Prevention Act did not go after the guys in, uh, that were the problem uh, in our state. They went after the licensed breeders of our state who were the good guys with unnecessary laws and regulations. In fact, our Missouri Department of Agriculture, who regulates and is responsible for regulating and enforcing our Animal Care Facilities Act, said that there was not one kennel in the state of Missouri that could comply with the regulations in Prop B. Not one. Not even our blue ribbon kennel level, which is the best of the best. Not a one of them at that point in time could comply with uh, Proposition B. So Proposition B was really not after better care for dogs. The intent was to put dog breeders out of business. If they could take dog breeding out of the state of Missouri, what have they just done? They've eliminated 30% of the puppies across this nation that for as far as were available for pets. Proposition B did not go after the unlicensed breeder, the bad guy. We have a program called Operation Bark Alert that our Department of Agriculture started about two years ago that is a 1-800 hotline. And basically that particular program is available for anybody to call in that it suspects abuse uh, of a dog breeder. And that program was being used, but the animal activists really didn't want to tell people out here, especially in our urban suburban areas, that that program was there. And just basically in the first year and a half of that particular program, Operation Bark Alert had been effective. I don't like to use the word rescued um, as the animal activists like to use when they go on a, uh, basically it's raiding a dog kennel, basically, as far as I'm concerned. But over the last year and a half, basically, 3,600 and some dogs had been, in their terms, in our Department of Agriculture's terms, rescued because of Operation Bark Alert. So we already had a program that was working and we did not need Prop B. In fact, our Department of Agriculture was not real active on this issue. Our governor did, did not want to be active on, on this issue because he knew it was a very contentious, emotional issue. So. Basically, they sat on the sidelines. They, our Department of Agriculture tried to be informational when they could, but really didn't, were not involved on agriculture side on, on this issue with that. And we were, we were disappointed uh, in that. And the other thing about uh, this particular ballot initiative, it did not uh, supply any type of funding that could help with enforcement uh, of, of, the, of the proposition with that. So what was the general response in Missouri with the ballot initiative? Basically, HSUS and other animal active supporters uh, were elated. They held big kickoff meetings across our state. Uh, they basically vowed to collect the appropriate number of signatures, get this on the ballot, and win. And, they ought to, and they, the first thing they always do is start dumping a lot of cash uh, from their pack into this particular uh, issue. The general public, on the other hand, was just kind of blasé about this. It wasn't a real big deal. A lot of them, weren't, they just did not pay attention. And they really did not pay attention 
until after this thing was certified uh, in May of 2010 and was going to be on our ballot in November uh, of 2010. However, on the other hand, the dog breeders and farmers across our state were basically fired up and ready to go to battle. So what were some of the concerns with Proposition B? And basically, the animal activists like to say, well, why, this is a dog issue, why is agriculture concerned about this? Why is livestock production agriculture concerned about this? Well, I think the first two things up there, maybe the first three things through there, that's why the rest of agriculture was concerned. This set a limit on the number of animals that a person could own of 50 breeding animals. It would only take about a two-word change in the ballot initiative if it ever got on our statutes to where it could affect the rest of livestock production. I don't know about you all, but I think 50 chickens in one of those 300 and 500 foot long broiler uh, would look pretty silly. The same way if you are a cow-calf operation. So that was a concern right there is the number of animals. It was setting a precedence, basically, um, that was not good. The other one that was a big one was the definition of a pet. If this issue was about dogs, then why was the definition of a pet in there any domesticated animal found near a home or dwelling? Well, when you stop and think about this, what other types of animals are found near a home or dwelling in rural, anywhere rural United States? It could be chickens, it could be cattle, pigs, horses. All could be classified as a pet. That would have to have been decided in our court system. Veterinary care guidelines were of concern there too. As farmers, we all like to, to do as much of the work as we can. We do have veterinarians out and we use medicines that are subscribed by our veterinarians, but we like to do as much of the work as we can in the same way with a dog breeder with that. Proposition B basically put in veterinary care guidelines that were probably better, uh, more better for the dogs than we do take care of our children. Uh, with that. So that was a big concern. And then housing requirements. And basically the housing requirements and, and like I say no kennel could at the time and still can't today comply with that. Unfettered access to the outside. So that means they would have to be able to get outside any time they wanted to go any hour of the day. At the same time you had to have unfettered access to the outside you had to keep temperatures between 40 degrees and 85 degrees. Now how can you, you know, that's pretty hard to do when there's unfettered access to the outside. The other thing here as far as an animal care issue and what they should have been concerned about, when puppies are born, they require 90 degrees uh, temperature to basically survive the first two or three days to have the best optimum care. Well, don't you think that HSUS and other animal activists, they put 85 degrees in there knowing that the public really doesn't know this, so we're going to stick this in there. It's going to sound great, but it's not the optimum temperature uh, there. Again, and I like to call it smoke, mirrors, and deception, that the things that they use out there. They tell you one story, but they deliver completely something different, and the unknowing, suspecting public does not have a clue to, to these types of things. No stacked cages. The animal activists led Missourians to believe that dogs were being raised in stacked cages letting the filth from the top fall down on top of the ones below when we all know that in stacked cages there is a tray there that catches that and those are cleaned daily with that. But yet the, the public thought that the filth was falling down on these animals. And the other thing they did, they sliced and diced here too they went after dog breeders. They did not go after veterinarians, research facilities, and other folks, uh, or, or your local shelters that use stacked cages. That's okay for them to use, but not for a dog breeder. So again, smoke mirrors and deception and basically a two-tiered uh, action through there. The other thing that was a big concern too was in Missouri, under the Act of Laws, basically, if you were not complying, it was a civil penalty and a fine. And Proposition B, it changed that whole ballgame. It took it from a civil penalty over to a crime and put in our criminal code and was a misdemeanor. So, and that's just exactly what they wanted. They wanted to take something 
uh, the, the current way that we have been regulating the current people that we trusted and basically change all of that. To, and, uh, and we'll talk about this here just in a little bit that the county sheriff would be the one that would administer the enforcement of, of some of these things. So the campaign. We knew what we needed to talk about. We knew the issues, why it wasn't good. And we were ready to go to battle. But we forgot one little thing. How do you fight this? The emotion of a puppy, man's best friend. So how do you not want to protect these little innocent puppies? That was very hard. And that was something that the rest of animal agriculture had to learn and deal with, but it was very, very hard uh, to do. And if you will indulge me, I'm going to kind of fly through the campaign part of this thing, and under what I'm going to call lessons learned at the end, we'll come back and incorporate several things that happened that I think we uh, need to share with people uh, as far as uh, things that you might want to remember and use in your own states uh, with that. The first thing that we had to deal with basically on our state is HSUS's survey that they did said that 89 out of 100 Missourians would sign that initiative petition. That was pretty disheartening. So if we use this as the first basis of a polling and how we moved from 89-11 down to about 51-49 in November, we did pretty darn good in our state moving the people we just didn't start quick enough uh, was a big problem through there. In our state, the dog breeders uh, took the lead uh, on this issue, which they should have, and most of the other ag organizations basically uh, supported what they were doing. But we have three professional, what I would call dog breeder organizations in our, our state, Missouri Federation of Animal Owners, Missouri Pet Breeder Association, and Professional Pet Association. Those three groups basically took the lead on this, and the egg organizations followed it. They followed what they did and supported them because they were a minority in our state, didn't have a whole lot of money to work with, period. And so the rest of agriculture finally came you know, along on board uh, with that. Our dog breeders filed a lawsuit against HSUS and the other, ASPCA and the Missouri Humane Society and the other groups that were bringing the ballot initiative basically on the basis of the ballot language and the ballot title being biased. Now, HSUS did everything they could. This lawsuit was filed in February. It did not get settled until August 9th, about four days before the state of Missouri had to print the ballots for our November election. HSUS did everything they could to drag this out. Every trick of the trade they could do, they did including going as low as hiring the brother of the judge that was trying the case so that the judge had to recuse himself from the case, which basically took it back to square one. And this was done uh, probably in July. So, I mean, every delay tactic that could be thought of, these guys are good, we don't like them, but they are good at what they do uh, with that. Now, as I said, most of the ag organizations uh, supported what they were doing. But there was kind of one little problem with, with some of them had with that, and that's the first figure up there. 89 out of 100 people are going to vote for this thing, or at least we'll sign that petition. We're going to get killed. So maybe we should just lay low, not do anything, save all of our time and resources when they come back to Missouri in 2012 with a livestock ballot initiative. But, but finally, I mean, the rest of the you know, organizations came to their senses with that. I mean, Farm Bureau was out front with this the whole way. We had members that were dog breeders. We had policy that supported what they were doing, and we were with them from the very beginning um, on this one. In the end, two coalitions were basically formed. Missourians for Animal Care was a group that the agriculture and dog breeders put together uh, to fight this organization, or to fight the ballot initiative. And then the other group that came along uh, that was formed as a result of some, a meeting in St. Louis uh, that I spoke at, three other people spoke at, uh, and trying to educate the urban people about that. And that was the Alliance for Truth. The Alliance for Truth was formed by uh, a couple out of, uh, out of Chesterfield, Missouri. They were the instigators of it. 
had a, and they had a daughter that was a politico, <laughs> and she worked on national case, not national uh, legislative uh, and campaigns, basically, with that. And they just called their daughter up and said, you know, this is not a good deal. They told her, and they just said, you're coming home, and you're going to spend the next three or four months in Missouri uh, helping to fight this battle. So this lady came back to Missouri and stayed, and basically just stayed in St. Louis, and her basis of influence was in the, the area of St. Louis with that, and we're going to talk about a little bit more about that uh, in Lessons Learned. Now, the other side has a lot of resources. One of those is a cartoonist named Patrick McDonald, who writes the Mutz strip. We were inundated with all of these cartoons, which was free advertising for the other side. There's another one. I'm not going to show all of them. We don't have time for that. But we were just were simply inundated with these particular cartoons day in and day out, all of them being negative against dog breeders and influencing and biasing the people, especially in urban, suburban uh, Missouri. Besides all of these cartoons that we had to deal with, just like the rest of you all, we had to deal with the TV commercials they put on there, the no on prop B commercials, and then the second series of commercials were their fundraising commercials, which you've all seen them. Please give us $19 a month, and we'll take care of all these poor dogs and cats. They throw a horse picture in the middle of it, and then at the end they roll the dairy cow out of that bucket loader truck. I mean, you've all seen these things. But they, they use emotion and pull on the heartstrings of the pet-owning suburban urban person to give to them. And these, these people not have, do not have a clue you know, what they're giving to with that. What these are is we had red and white, basically no one prop B signs. And we had them up all over the state. These particular signs came from Kansas City. These were, came from... A uh, company from downtown Kansas City who was supporting our cause. The signs were basically taken off their stands, turned inside out, and then you can see what was what was written on them, and they were taped back up on on the signs. And you notice Alf being on there, Animal Liberation Front. So I mean, these were the types of things that we dealt with, especially in urban, suburban uh, Missouri, with that. Now. One of the things that we were concerned about the most was the official ballot language. Uh, I said that the dog breeders filed a case uh, against this, and we eventually lost that case. Kind of skipped some things in through there. But they filed that law case uh, with this Prop B language because of the title and then of the language. And the thing that we feared the most was, just read the first paragraph if you can re read that. Who is not going to agree with that. Not one person in the state of Missouri or any other place would say, well, you know, I, I don't agree with that. Well, of course everybody agrees with that first paragraph. They're not going to read the rest of it. They're not going to read the entire initiative petition that has the onerous parts in it. Our Secretary of State, Robin Carnahan, okayed this ballot language. Uh, and at the time, she was also running for U.S. Senate slot. Uh, in Missouri. She got very handily beat by Representative Blunt to be our, and then he is our new senator. So <clears throat> they have their people put in places, just as the lady said with the question earlier about people at USDA, and I mean, they have their people placed around in different areas that they can, their go-to people, you know, with that. But we were very concerned about, about the uneducated voter coming in and seeing this, this for the first time and saying, well, I agree with that, I'm going to vote yes. Now, election day came. What happened? Basically, we lost 51-48, 51-49 there. We had moved the poll that much. And as you can see on the map through this, this wasn't a Republican or a Democrat issue. This was a rural-urban issue. The urban-suburban people are two to five generations away from the farm. They don't understand what we do in agriculture today. They remember agriculture back in a more subsistence manner, and that's what they believe agriculture should be. And that was, when I would go into St. Louis and Kansas City, 
uh, to do presentations, that was one of the things that I had to deal with was their perception of agriculture, their perception uh, of dog breeders uh, with that. Somebody asked me how much money we spent in this particular campaign, and I said, well, I'm going to cover that. The folks that were in favor of Proposition B, the animal activists, spent $4.6 million on this particular issue uh, in Missouri. Over half of that money came from HSUS. A very, another significant portion of it came from ASPCA. And the other big time donor to this uh, was, uh, and I don't remember their name off the hand, but their home base is in Utah uh, with that. So if you would take that $4.6 million that they spent and divide it out by the number of yes votes that they got, they spent $4.62 per yes vote. Now, no on Prop B, of which we were. I stated earlier, the dog breeders did not have much money to work with. Lots of agricultural organizations, even though they were on board, <coughs> said, well, you know, we'll, we're going to spend some money, but we're not going to, we're going to wait and use our resources for the next time around uh, on this when they come after us, livestock agriculture. Between the Alliance for Truth and Missourians for Animal Care, just two, a little less than $200,000 or right at maybe a little over was used on the vote no side. Now, if you would divide that out by the no side, it comes out to 21 cents per no vote. So it's a big, big discrepancy on who's got the money and how it's going to be used. Agriculture, we're never ever going to be the fundraising force probably that the other side is. So we have to work smarter and we have to work harder with that. Election night, our side was ahead of this thing pretty handily. Many Missourians went to bed thinking that Proposition B was going to be defeated, only to wake up the next morning and find out that the other side squeaked out a win. Even Wayne Pacelli, who was in St. Louis at their uh, campaign or party headquarters for that night, and reporters were with him, and there's you know a story written on about you know probably 7, 8 o'clock at night, they were starting to think, hmm, we're going to get beat, and how, what message do we give to the public on why we've been beat for the first time? So they were starting down the path of, of writing a whole different scenario than what, the, what wound up being the next morning. And it wasn't until about 11.30 at night that Wayne Pacelli felt like that they had been pulled out, and that was because all the St. Louis folks started coming in. They were they're always the last ones uh, to come in. It seems like we always wind up having uh, some voter issues in St. Louis, and guess what? They extend the hours that people can vote. It's just, I mean, it shouldn't happen, but it does in our state. The next day after the election was over, agriculture had been beaten. We had several of our state senators and state representatives vow to initiate legislation that would remedy the problem that was going to be facing our dog breeders, which was basically putting them out of business. All the newspapers in this state, and especially the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, is very biased uh, towards the animal activist. They basically started, their editorial board started writing that we should you know, stand by the will of the people. So that became the big issue between November and January 1, when our legislature was going back in to say this, we need to abide by the will of the people. Guess what else happened after the day after the election? We weren't done with our cartoons yet. But guess what? This one focused on a different industry, chickens. And we can see where they went. This came out November the 4th, and now we know that they uh, basically went on out into what Art, Oregon, and Washington with these issues and maybe some others um, on after cage layers. So, I mean, they have a game plan, and we, you know, with that, that's probably spread out here for years, uh, you know, with that. And that's a thing that we have to, that people have to understand, farmers have to understand, the consumer has to stand. This is just one of many battles, and they're just going to continually come at us. They're hoping they can wear us down, basically, with that, and we cannot allow that to happen. When our legislature came back into session, they were faced with four billboards that were on the, the uh, every of the main roads coming into Missouri. And basically, you can see where they were, as, you know, you know, why are Missouri voters who supported Prop B being ignored? Because they knew there was going to be a big battle uh, there because of the repeals, the will of the people issue. 
Tom mentioned the lobbyist issue there. Uh, I guess our lobbyist in Missouri uh, will do anything for a buck because they hired about four uh, significant law or lobbying firms in, in Missouri that stood by, uh, by them during this campaign, uh, during our state legislative session with that. But I can tell you the ag community uh, will not, you know, they, they, those guys will be paying a price, you know, for doing that. There are several of those guys that run rural uh, state rep and state senate campaigns that will not be doing that you know, in the future. Several bills were filed in January, all the way from repealing Prop B to modifying Prop B somewhat. Finally, uh, what we call Senate Bill 113 was settled upon, uh, which basically uh, did not repeal Prop B, as the papers like to report out to the people. We like to say it enhanced. B. It kept the voters intent by having stricter regulations uh, for dog breeders. It provided a funding mechanism in there for enforcement and inspection, but it kept our breeders in business. Those that wanted to stay in business, it, it would keep them in business uh, with that. When 113 was passed, our governor was faced with a huge problem. Was he going to sign the bill? Was he not going to sign the bill? During his three, two and a half years as governor, he had not upset probably one person in our state. Our governor is very good about staying right in the middle and not going anywhere else. Well, he was just getting ready to, to piss off 50% of the people in Missouri if he signed it or he didn't sign it. He's, you know, big election next year in 2012, so he was in a big dilemma. What was he going to do? As I said earlier, our Department of Agriculture, and he had stayed out of the fray of this thing on the sidelines. Well, our governor had to come up with some type of plan to, uh, to save himself with this, so he basically asked our director of agriculture in Missouri to sit down with our dog breeders and the Missouri Humane Society, not HSUS, the Missouri Humane Society, and try to come up with something, and then we won't use the words compromise, we like to use new agreement, uh, you know, with that, and so that happened. I think the dog breeders came to the table and they gave some things up, uh, there, but that what they gave up they felt like was insignificant. I mean, not insignificant, but what's probably going to happen to them eventually anyway, so they gave them up earlier, basically in return for an emergency clause being put into this piece of legislation that put, put 113 into enforcement the day it was signed by the governor. Because HSUS was, was basically proposing to come back with us with what we call a citizen's initiative. In other words, they would put Senate Bill 113 on the ballot in 2012. So it would, it would stop 113 from going into law. Uh, but the problem with that was if we stopped 113 from going into law and the citizen's initiative worked, Prop B would go into effect in, in November of this year and put our dog breeders out of business before the people could vote on that. So with the emergency clause that was put in there, um, basically dog breeders got to stay, stay in business. And I'm going to speed up through here. Had a, held a big rally to force the governor to sign Proposition 113 before our General Assembly would pick up uh, what we call the Missouri Solution. And that Missouri Solution basically was only asking the Missouri Humane Society basically split the Missouri Humane Society off from um, the HSUS. Lessons learned what happened to us. Whenever you get into these issues, you have to start early. You cannot procrastinate. You need to avoid the distractions. We waited for that lawsuit, thinking that it was common sense that a judge would throw it out. They didn't. We didn't get started on the campaign till August. You had September, October, and then the election the first week of November. You've got to have coalitions. You can't do this by yourself. You have to encourage fundraising from the very beginning. Agriculture is not good at raising funds, but we just have to be out there uh, and do that. You have to identify the allies that you can use uh, with that, and they may be people you're not used to, uh, to be working with uh, with that. One of these I didn't write up here was the Tea Party in Missouri. Uh, for some reason, the Missouri Tea Party basically picked up that Prop B was important and they should be opposing it. They were a big help uh, you know, with that. You need to develop a standard presentation uh, and make a, a distribution uh, of that as well. 
I did over 108 presentations, and that's actually traveling the state of Missouri out doing talks on, on this thing before there. I just couldn't hit everybody. Presentations about 50 minutes. I cut it down to 17. We videoed it, put it on a DVD, and then we sent hundreds of those things out across our state. And people use them going to, uh, you know, chamber meetings, Kiwanis Club meetings, women's sororities. We had to influence the influencers in a community to help them uh, on our side. And, and by having a standard presentation, putting on DVD, a lot of people are willing to go introduce a subject uh, but not uh, speak for that long. You have to have good materials. Basically one that we use that kind of came to the foundation of all of our stuff is the domino effect here. It was very effective in through there, and you can see on the top of the dominoes, you know, pets, pork, poultry, beef, dairy, farming, hunting. People have to understand there is a, you know, people are, are all lined up in a row and they're going to take them out one at a time with that. The other thing that was very, very effective, we have to connect the dots. And I have to give Karen Strange with Missouri Federation of Animal Owners uh, credit for this one is there are 12 steps to the animal activist agenda through here. And I'm not going to read those, but you can read them very quickly. There are 12 steps. You have to tie the dots together to show people that there, this is this this is a plan. This is an attack. It's a campaign. They have to see all these things that are going on and that are working, so that they understand this. What I liked about this one, I could get to number ten and read number ten. Stop any further breeding of companion animals, including purebred dogs and cats. Spaying and neutering should be subsidized by state and municipal governments. Abolish commerce and animals for the pet trade. Number 10 was exactly what Proposition B was about in Missouri. So I could tell them that, and then boom, here's, here's the uh, punchline. Uh, what did I do? I think I forgot to put that slide in. Anyways, these 12 items came from a book that was published in 1987. So for a quarter of a century, these things have been around. The animal activist people have been doing them. We just haven't been paying attention. They have to understand you have to connect the dots for them. Always have to look for opportunities to educate urban citizens. If an urban areas are a factor as they are in Missouri, Kansas City, St. Louis, you, have, you need to have a full-time campaign person just to work the urban areas that agriculture does not understand how to work in. That's where the Alliance for Truth came in. You need to be tracking the opposition's campaign funding and sharing that uh, with the public. You have to brand them as out-of-state, as Nebraska was talking about. The other thing that we like to do, they like to talk about factory farming. We like to talk about HSUS as a factory farming, or factory fundraising machine. A factory fundraising machine, that's exactly what they are. Social media is great. Uh, Got to look for opportunities for free media, radio shows, uh, and also for creative, cheap advertising. Uh, cable TV, website manners, and so forth are very effective uh, with some of these things. And what we also found out is our youth in our state are a big resource and asset for us on this issue. Our Collegiate Farm Bureau chapters, FFA chapters across the state, 4-H clubs got very involved and very active uh, with this. Other legislative proposals basically in our state deal with the ballot initiative process. And probably the one that has the biggest chance of happening is increasing the number of required signatures and number of uh, congressional districts uh, to do that. We also have a constitutional amendment uh, that would give the, preserve the rights of people to raise animals in our state. So what's our next battle? HSUS and animal activists are sore losers. Uh, they don't, you know, so far we've stayed one step ahead of them uh, since the General Assembly came back in January. But now they are proposing another ballot initiative called the Voter Protection Act. The Voter Protection Act would not, would, if, it, if our legislators wanted to change something that people voted on, it would take 70% in our House and Senate, which would be very difficult uh, to get. And guess who are the people pushing this one? The Voter Protection Alliance, you recognize the first two names there. Now they're trying to get more credibility by adding these other, other groups into there. <laughs>